We hear that all the time, that they have been traumatized and they will have specific flashbacks of experiences when they were restrained. Tonight, an investigation into the use of physical restraints on youth in care group homes. We tried to do things on our own because we thought it was going to be a uh, you know, some sort of uh, small job. There's no quick fix to problems affecting this school in an Algonquin community north of Ottawa. Oh, I'm here for the native grad because I am graduating this year. And the excitement over graduation grows among high school students in the Yukon. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. Uh, we continue our series tonight investigating the state of Ontario's child welfare system with a startling figure, 2,000. That's the number of times in a single year kids and youth in that province were physically restrained. 87% of the time those restraints happened in group homes where kids live in a communal house with staff. The data from 2020 to 2021 was uncovered in, in, in a joint investigation by Global News and APTN, which also found a pattern of physical interventions at some privately operated group homes and youth who say the use was unjustified. So what does it mean to be restrained? Global's Carolyn Jarvis shows us firsthand. I'm going to fold you down. This. Whoa. Okay. Is what a restraint can look like for kids in group homes. I'm going to go quick. Yes. Okay. This is how you hold somebody in a prone position. A physical intervention the Ontario government only permits as a last resort. And so this is where a restraint could stop. Yeah. When there's an imminent risk of harm to a youth or others. A little step down. Wow. Okay. Whoa. But people who grew up in group homes told us they're used far more frequently to get kids to comply. For me, it feels like a body check to the floor. Ari Calero Romero, who was developmentally delayed, was restrained 69 times during the year and a half he lived at an Ottawa group home. Pain. It hurts. Yes. Ari lived at a group home run by a private company called Mary Homes, which according to our analysis, had one of the highest number of physical interventions among service providers in the province. My arm snapped. Ari was 12 in September of 2019, when he was restrained on the floor yet again. His account of what happened and the incident report from workers differs greatly. What isn't contested is that it ended with his left arm broken. Ari is now suing Mary Holmes for $200,000. Mary Holmes wouldn't comment on the incident nor its frequent use of restraints, but intends to defend against the lawsuit. It's a very scary experience, especially for kids with mental health issues. Psychologist Maurice Ferrugi says restraints are an ineffective tool that further damages vulnerable young people. We hear that all the time, that they have been traumatized and they will have specific flashbacks of experiences when they were restrained and these will last throughout their lives. It tells me that adults have lost control. What's crucial, says crisis intervention trainer Steve Hall, is that staff know how to de-escalate situations. Carolyn, we don't want to go here. And not be triggered themselves. A vast majority of the situations that I was involved with or I witnessed could have been avoided if adults would have been in better balance emotionally. He says the best restraint comes from care providers who don't use force. Carolyn Jarvis for APTN National News. You can find much more on that joint investigation on our website, aptnnews.ca. To Manitoba, where Indigenous women's groups and political parties have signed off on an open letter to the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs. The letter is critical of the way the AMC is handling sexual assault allegations against Grand Chief Arlen Dumas by a number of women. It says a request to meet the Chiefs to talk about a trauma-informed way of helping the women who made the allegations has gone unanswered. The letter calls for an independent inquiry co-led by the AMC and victim advocates. Dumas was suspended by the chiefs earlier this year after a senior AMC employee accused him of sexual assault. Since then, a few more women have come forward. No criminal charges have been laid against Dumas. 
A Freedom of Information request by the Canadian press shows that in Manitoba last year, 339 newborns were apprehended, just 47 fewer than in 2020 when the province said it stopped the controversial practice that notifies child welfare agencies when certain women give birth. Joining us now is Kelly Geraldine Malone, the reporter who broke this story. Kelly, thanks for being with us. Uh, we know in the two years since the government said it was putting an end to birth alerts that parents and advocates were saying they were still happening. What prompted you to get this data through a freedom of information request? Well, I think I was probably hearing a lot of the same things as you, that parents were still worried that children and newborns were being apprehended despite the practice of birth alerts ending. But another part is that at the Canadian press in our reporting of child and welfare services in Manitoba, we often include a line that says, on average, one newborn is seized a day in Manitoba a year. And so I need to file freedom of information requests just to ensure that that, when I put it in an article, remains true. And obviously with the end of birth alerts, we were looking to see if that number had dropped significantly and if that was no longer true. But last week I had just received um, the information back from my last freedom of information request for birth alerts and for children seized between the ages of zero and 12 months for the year of 2021. And it showed that hundreds of babies were still seized despite birth alerts ending. So we know Manitoba has the highest number of kids in care per capita, huge disproportionate number of those are Indigenous children. Now this started under the previous NDP government, but the current progressive conservative government vowed to fix it. That's obviously not happened if only 47 fewer babies were seized. What else have you learned in covering this? Well, I want to go back a little bit to how this actually came about. So last week I was in my office and uh, my office is in the provincial legislature. And so we were listening to question period and I had just received that information that showed that hundreds of babies were still seized last year. And Families Minister Rochelle Squires said during question period that 75 per, there was a 75% reduction in newborn at birth seizures since the end of birth alerts. And immediately, you know, those journalism senses start tingling because I obviously had my own database that showed that that wasn't quite true. Mm -hmm. So while I was looking into this, I ended up having to spend days just trying to clarify what the minister had said in question period because it didn't match the numbers that I'd received from the province themselves. So initially they said that um, she wasn't talking about at birth newborns. She was talking about zero to 12 months. And so I sent them the information that I had where that percentage didn't match up. There was no 75% reduction in the information that I had. And then they clarified again that she was actually talking about since 2016. And once again, I sent back my numbers and said, well, since 2016, I also have those numbers that also doesn't equal a 75% reduction. And then there was a further clarification where they said they were hoping to reach a 75% reduction by the end of this year. So from what I learned from that is I think a lot of people who report on child welfare um, and specifically the numbers around it show that know that it can be quite confusing that yeah. definitions change. And I think something that I learned is that even within the government itself, there might be some confusion about just where we're at when it comes to child apprehensions. Thankfully, you had your freedom of information requests. Uh, so has the government given any explanation as to why so little has changed? Well, the government did not give a direct response to my questions asking for clarification around this. Minister Squires did speak in um, question period that all levels of government and all levels of community need to work together, and that there needs to be a new path forward when it comes to child welfare. But I did speak with advocates in the community who work with this, um, including Cora Morgan, the First Nations Child and Family Advocate, and she said that what she's seeing is mothers that are going home and then the child being apprehended. And so they might not fall into the category of an at birth apprehension, but it's still a baby under the one, one year of age being apprehended. And she said what that means is that women are talking to each other and they're concerned. So the big reason why birth alerts were removed 
was that a report showed that it was discouraging pregnant women and their families from reaching out for prenatal support. Mm -hmm. So Morgan told me that mothers are still apprehensive about going for prenatal support because they feel like while they might not have the technical term of birth alert, they might still get flagged for being followed or watched or um, looked at by the child welfare system just for going in for prenatal supports. Kelly, we'll have to leave it there, but uh, appreciate this and your reporting on it and uh, keeping the government on its toes. Thanks. Thank you. Time to step out for a quick break. Coming up, dozens of students looking for a new place to get their education. Welcome back. A thermal coal mine near Jasper National Park is looking to expand its operations. And they say they don't need an environmental assessment to do so. But environmental organizations are fighting to ensure that assessment goes ahead. APTN's Chris Stewart has more. The proposed expansion of the Vistal Thermal Coal Mine in Hinton, Alberta is causing concern from the keepers of the water. The Indigenous-run nonprofit's goal is to protect the world's most precious resource, water. They have partnered with the West Athabasca Watershed Bioregional Society and EcoJustice to ensure that a federally mandated federal impact assessment goes ahead. Coal mines that expand 50% or more have a federal impact assessment automatically triggered. Then Environment Minister Jonathan Wilkinson deemed the expansion close enough to 50% that he ordered the review. But Colesboro Mines appealed that decision and have been fighting in court to stop the assessment. 
Equal Justice Lawyer Daniel Cheater argued in the Federal Court of Appeal that the assessment ordered by the Minister of Environment and Climate Change in 2020 needs to be done. Cheater says the expansion would release 33 megatons of carbon annually. There's serious potential impacts from the mine itself uh, in the local environment, um, primarily impacts on water, uh, at-risk fish like rainbow trout and bull trout, um, one of which has critical habitat protected about 100 meters away from the mine itself, um, air pollution concerns, uh, methane. He says with Canada and the entire world cutting carbon emissions, an expansion of a thermal coal mine, one of the worst polluting fossil fuels, makes no sense. This kind of project is not needed uh, uh, at this time, given the, the climate crisis and the need to reduce global emissions. Um, and that was one of the reasons we asked the minister to designate the mine. Where all of, Jesse Cardinal is, is the executive director of the Keepers of the Water. She says a federal impact area. assessment has to be done to ensure the safety of ecosystems near the mine, which is only 40 kilometers from the Rocky Mountains. And to us, that's like the bare minimum. That that should happen automatically with huge projects. Um, you know, especially when we're looking at it's going to be one of the biggest thermal coal projects um, in Canadian history. Canada has put a date of 2030 to stop burning thermal coal, but the exporting of it would still be allowed. The province looks at the resources as it's their resources, but it's not their resources. It's the future generation's resources. It's First Nations resources. And we have seen what we have seen with the provinces, especially in Alberta, for example, is that the environment is at the bottom of the list. So they're not concerned about the, the environment. They don't care about you or me. They care about money. No one from Colesboro Mines who owned the Vista Mine returned APTN's calls. A decision by the Federal Court of Appeal three-judge panel is expected in the upcoming months. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. An Algonquin community in Quebec has been forced to close its elementary school due to leaking pipes. It isn't the first time Barrier Lake has had to find alternative solutions for over 80 kids to learn in a safe environment. And F. Francis reports. You can't see it from here, but underneath this elementary school is a danger, sewage. We tried to do things on our own because we thought it was going to be, um, you know, some sort of a uh, small job. But when we actually got underneath it, it was, uh, you know, it was huge because we had to take away at least over six inches of sand uh, that needed to be taken out and, you know, uh, dump someplace uh, uh, away from the community because you know it's it's the stench was pretty bad leaking pipes have been a long time issue year after year in the 50 year old building aptn documented that same crawl space with mold six years ago once again the children are forced to settle somewhere else we're mobilizing uh the, the staffing we're mobilizing the children into uh you know uh, other places where there's no uh mold contamination you know we've used one of our uh, teachers residents to turn that into a school uh, we've also used a uh, head start uh, head start uh, building according to ex-chief casey ratt if the federal government had followed through with plans years ago the kids would be in a new school by now he said the holdup is due to the fact the community which is located three hours north of ottawa is not hooked up to the electrical grid it continues to run on generators there was funding for a new school uh, we did every uh, everything that we had to we we had uh, soil testing we had uh, you know uh, architects uh, all this stuff that uh, to build a new school um, was done and then last minute ISC turns around and says well you won't get a new school until you hook up you know until you find a, a source of uh, electric uh, you know power Rat says air quality testing is supposed to start next week, but he doesn't feel safe having his own kids going into the building. No matter what, they're looking at another solution. Put forth, uh, you know, some ideas, maybe uh, having trailers uh, sent to the community and setting them up as classrooms. Uh, that's an option. Um, again, but we need ISC's uh, funding and funding to be able to. Uh, 
put that uh, put that uh, action into uh, on the ground. Indigenous Services spokesperson Megan McLean says they continue to work with the community to ensure the students are in a safe and healthy environment and that until the community provides clear direction on the power supply and school site, construction cannot begin. Annette Francis, APTN National News, Ottawa. Every year families in the Beaufort Delta region of the Northwest Territories head out on the water for muskrat camp. And as APTN learns, you can get a lot of rats in five weeks. The goal was to get 200 rats to get $1,000. And with the knowledge learned from his auntie and uncle, Kenneth Kivik helped successfully harvest 211 muskrat. That means a grand up front when they bring the furs to the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. And another $1,000 when the furs are sold at auction. And with a packed freezer full of meat to share with elders, Kenneth says it was a great experience. So this is what this muskrat sounds like. So they're not really loud, it's just like a little squeak that you make with your lips. Enjoyed it out there and it's something different for me too because I'm not from originally around here, I'm from the tundra uh, where it's flat land and all that so I had a great experience. Everyone everyone was all together, one big team, helping skin, helping stretch, helping gut, brush the fur, dry the fur. Time now for another quick break. When we come back, 108 high school students are chomping at the bit to graduate. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. And our very own Charmaine Straker shared this photo from a recent walk through Winnipeg's Kildonan Park with her adorable little dogs, clearly not pictured here. 
If you have a photo, email it to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Now here's tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, 22 and cloudy for Halifax, 15 in St. John's. 21 above with showers in Kuduak, sun's out and 11 in Nain. 22 with showers in Montreal, 21 in rain in Val d'Or. 22 with rain for Sault Ste. Marie, 21 in rain in North Bay. Rain and 20 for Thunder Bay, one degree cooler with rain in Sioux Lookout. Plus six in Churchill, 20 with rain in God's Lake. 23 for Winnipeg, Brandon and Dauphin. 23 in Regina, 25 in Saskatoon. 26 for Uranium City, 25 in Stony Rapids. In Northern Alberta, sun's out and 27 for Fort McMurray. 24 with the sun out in Fort Chip. 19 in rain in Edmonton, 22 in Lethbridge. Showers in 20 for Vancouver, rain in 23 in Kamloops. 18 with rain in Prince George and Dees Lake. Plus three with a chance of snow in Old Crow, 21 in Whitehorse. 24 for Yellowknife, 16 in Norman Wells. Plus one and cloudy in Saks Harbor, cloudy in four in Politech. Sunny and 17 for Chesterfield, 14 in Whale Cove. Chance of snow and minus one in Resolute, zero with snow in Arctic Bay. Well, it's that time of year again, graduation season. On Friday, over 100 high school graduates gathered in Whitehorse with their regalia at a First Nations graduation ceremony. Our reporter Sarah Connors caught up with some of those grads to see how they're feeling about their big day. Oh, I'm here for the native grad because I am graduating this year. Uh, pretty nervous, excited, a little bit of both. Yeah. He's, he's not he's even graduating. Graduate. <laughs> <laughs> my mother sold the uh, embroidery and my godmother put it all together and had uh, the Delta braid down here put on. My future plans are going back to school down the line and probably have kids. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. I'm feeling happy. I'm like all this beautiful people here, all their beautiful regalia and it's I don't know, I feel like I'm in the right place right now. <laughs> I am looking into doing nursing schools, like doing nursing courses. There's a two-year course up in the college there that I'm looking into. Wow. Yeah, so I made this in three in less, than, uh, less than three weeks to get it done for today. And it, it symbolizes my clan. I'm a wolf. And I have these paws cause for my brothers, because they're both wolves. <laughs> I have all different kinds of mixed feelings, but mostly I'm incredibly proud of myself. Like. Uh, if I like, if this was me last year, I would have never thought I would have made it here. And yeah, I'm just super proud of myself, and it's such a good day. <laughs> I got accepted into Yukon University, and uh, I'm undecided between business and social work, but I'm leaning more towards social work. My auntie um, Marla Charlie, she made she made the dress and the slippers, and she was my mom's best friend, who is. Um, she passed on a while ago and so um, the belt, my grandma Winnie Greenland from McPherson made it. This is like just the first step of like the next chapter of my life and it's just something to celebrate. Absolutely beautiful stuff there. Congrats to all the grads. Hopefully we'll hear more of your stories yet in the next couple of weeks. That's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Tuesday. For news anytime and more on anything you've seen here, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you back here tomorrow.